Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and today's guest is Elliot Bisnell. Elliot is co-founder of the highly popular Summit Series, which is a global company that has produced over 250 events over the last decade. The occasion for today's chat is Elliot's new book, Make No Small Plans, Lessons on Thinking Big, Chasing Dreams, and Building Community that he wrote with the other Summit Series founders. And I'm so excited to share this conversation with you, and I think you're going to get a lot of value out of it. So let's get this conversation going. And welcome Elliot Bisnell to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Elliot, welcome to the podcast. Let's do it, Doug. How are you, man? Excited to be on. I'm excited to have you, and we have we definitely have some mutual friends. And I like I was telling you before we recorded, I've been following what Summit has been doing over the last couple of years, and I've been heavily intrigued. And when I saw the opportunity to interview you, I was like, man, this is going to be awesome because we're going to unpack unpack a lot. But I want to start with a quote from you from our mutual friend, Mike Posner, where you said, I think it was something like, not all crazy ideas are great, but all great ideas are crazy or or something to that extent. So if you could maybe unpack that a little bit and like maybe what you meant by that and um, like what you hope for somebody to get the most out of when, when you, when you speak about that, that sort of thing. Well, I think the example that you're bringing up is that a few years ago, Mike Posner was asking people if they thought he should walk across America. And I believe that basically every person he asked said that is a ridiculous and crazy idea. And so when he asked me, I asked him, well, what does everybody else think? And he said, well, everybody else thinks it's crazy. And I said, well, that's great news. He said, why is that great news that everyone thinks it's crazy? And I said, well... Obviously, like most crazy ideas probably don't work out. Like most crazy ideas probably are just not that great. But every great idea is crazy. So if everybody says it's crazy, there's definitely a chance that this could be the thing for you to do. And I think, look, in general, my view on life, Doug, is a contrarian approach. Like when everybody's walking one way... I've always thought I should check the other way. And I think so often in our lives, you know, people follow each other. You know, real estate's really expensive. Well, that must mean it's a, it's a great, we have to be buying. Well, no, not necessarily. Everyone's buying these stocks that, and it's all time high. We have to, then it must be, they must be valuable. Well, no, not necessarily. Everyone's doing a certain diet. So I should do it. No, you actually need to dig in learn about it, figure out what's right, do the work. And so, you know, for me, I've just approached everything thinking if everybody says something like you have to have a college degree, well, maybe, but let's at least give the the crazy other idea a chance. That that makes a lot of sense. And I think it is important to be aware of these sort of things and know that just because everybody else is going with like one thing doesn't necessarily mean it's the right thing or even like the right thing for you. And you're right. Like a lot of crazy ideas that people have, whether it's personally or professionally, they they don't pan out. But I think you can give yourself a really good shot at making them pan out if, if you do certain things to at least get you in the game a little bit. And I know for you, you end up going off to college at Wisconsin. You end up, I think, having like a tennis injury that kind of ends your dreams of being like a tennis player. And then you're kind of forced to make a decision after that. And then eventually you start this summit series, which has become like one of the most acclaimed networking, personal development events there is. And I got to imagine that that all kind of seemed crazy to you when you first started it. So if you were to go back and maybe connect the dots a little bit, like if somebody's listening to this and they have an idea they want to start, whether it's a business or an idea that they want to pursue, whether it's a business, whether it's something personally, like what are some things they can do to help maybe mitigate the risk, maybe stay mentally sound and make sure they give themselves the best shot to complete it? Well, I'm a big fan of taking risks that have very little downside. And I think most people think that when you take a risk, all risks are the same. Okay. That's obviously not the case, right? Like, um, you know, riding a bicycle 
around the world is, you know, a lot riskier than starting a nonprofit while you're in college that costs 500 bucks to get started, right? There are a lot of very practical things you can do that appear risky, but are not. And so when you're judging and trying to decide, like, what am I going to do? It's important to actually think about, well, how far can I fall? And, you know, dropping out of college and spending all your money, like that's a pretty risky thing. Like you spent all your money and you gave up your college dreams. Staying in college, spending a little bit of your savings to start something, whether it's a movement or a business or a nonprofit, like what's the worst that's going to happen? You lose 500 bucks or a couple thousand bucks and some people laugh at you and it damages, you know, your ego a little bit. And so, for example, say somebody wants to write a poetry book, like There's not a lot of risk in that if you're a a young up and coming poet or you want to write a cookbook, you know, or you want to try out for a sports team. So I think within your dreams, like you just really need to assess like how risky is the thing you want to do? And finally, what is the, the way to do your dream and take the least risk possible as a first step? Right, right. And I think one of the things you pointed out that is is so important for people to hear is like the importance of like protecting the downside, because I think that really not only mitigates some of the risk, but it also like helps you bounce back up a little bit more if it doesn't work out, where if you put all your eggs into one basket and you have no idea like what you're doing, you don't know anybody in the industry, you're just kind of going at it like blind, like that's pretty high risk. And if you end up failing at that or it doesn't work out, yeah, you'll bounce back eventually and, and hopefully get into something else. But it could take a long time, right? You know, depending on like what you did financially and, and that sort of thing. I know one of the keys for, were you going to say something? Yeah, I was just going to say, let me give you a very practical example. When my dad and I started a business, I was in college. It was his first business. And let me tell you what we did not do. We did not mortgage our family's house. I did not drop out of college immediately, and I did not spend every dollar of my savings. What we did do is we started a very low barriers to entry business, which was an online email newsletter. We basically had to put zero dollars in because it cost a few bucks to send an email newsletter then, I don't know, 30 bucks a month or something. And I sold ads from my dorm room. And I only decided to drop out of college after six months once we were making revenue, right? And so there's a lot of different ways to start a business. There's a lot of different ways to start the same business. And the how you do it is extremely important, right? You, you could want to write a book and you could spend all your savings on marketing it. You could, you know, drop out of school to do it. You, and then there's a very cost efficient, low risk way. And it's always best because ideas are risky to start off in a low risk way, take the plunge, which is the hardest thing to do. And as it starts to work, you can begin to scale up. Right. Those are, those are some really, really solid pieces of advice. One of the things I wanted to ask that just came to my mind is um, there's a lot of kids that when they're in college, they're at that age and they're seeing all their friends go to college, they're finishing their four-year degree and going the quote unquote, like traditional American dream of finishing the four-year degree, getting a job, you know, getting married, that sort of thing. I see kids who aren't going that route. They get super low self-esteem. They feel hyper competitive to their peers and they end up almost going down this, this victim shaming downward spiral that leads them to make poor decisions. Like what were some of the things that you did when you were going through that process, like going this contrarian route to the typical college kid that kind of kept you remaining authentic to yourself and mentally stable through that process? The biggest thing you can take away from the question you just asked is to start thinking that basically always the problem is the solution. And what that means is that if you don't have a college degree On the surface, that's a big problem, right? The question is how you could make that problem a solution. And because we know that employers tend to look at people with college degrees as more educated, and anyone without a college degree, they're going to look at less educated, the solution is to take your non-college degree, which is me, I do not have a college degree, and to flip it on its head. And I was actually talking to a young person, 21 years old, who didn't even go to high school 
And they were in that same dilemma that you're talking about, super depressed, low self-esteem. Well, how could I ever get a job? And I said, well, how do you make the problem the solution? I said, what about this? What if you figured out all the things you didn't learn in high school and all the things you didn't learn in college, but you really na- you know, narrowed it down to the important things, the history of the world, right? You don't need to learn trigonometry, but the history of the world. Okay, why don't you go read Sapiens and notate every single page? That'll be a good start. You know, basic accounting. Okay, go take a free accounting class. Uh, he, he said he didn't know how to type. I said, okay, while we were talking, I looked up, I found a link, 11 free typing courses, 20 hours. I said, go learn this, go out of type. I said, make a list of the 50 things or 30 things you didn't learn, you wish you did, and go learn them all. I think you could learn them all over the next 12 to 18 months. Document your process and go show any employer that you didn't finish high school and you didn't go to college but you spent like 4,000 hours making it all up and here's how you figured it all out and see what they say and if they're interested in hiring you. And I said, I guarantee you, you will cut to the line of almost any employer who person after person after person sees kids with college degrees and then they meet this one person whose family was too poor in this kid's instance to, to, to even send him to high school. Like they, they literally didn't have the money for a variety of reasons. And they meet the, this employer meets this one kid who actually goes and teaches himself every single thing and documents the journey. How do you think you'll stand out now? And that's the definition of how can the problem become the solution? Right. I love that. And I love the idea of being proactive and controlling what you can. Because I think you're right. I think in many cases, all employers are looking for when they see that college degree is that you were able to complete something, that you had some discipline, that you showed some work ethic, and that you were actually like pursuing something with some sort of drive. And I think when you don't have a degree and you don't do anything about it, that kind of, like you said, is a problem. But the solution is how can you take the things you can control and almost replicate this, the college degree in a way that works for you. I know one of the things that was very helpful for you was you were an an amazing networker and your ability to build and cultivate relationships through the years to not only build the business and create summit series, but also bring, I mean, some of the most notable guests to your events that exist a lot of people are trying to figure out like how to network. That's a big buzzword now. People are going to conferences, people are DMing each other online. And but I think people can have a hard time with it. Maybe they come across a bit awkward or they almost try too hard. So what have been some of your best practices when it comes to networking over the years that have that have helped it be a, a bit more smooth for you? Like any other skill set, you know, networking, building relationships takes a lot of work. And it takes a lot of practice. And I was definitely not good at it when I first started. And I think that I did think of relationships as networking. Whereas now I have a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth of even the term networking, which kind of, it's a good term to use because it everyone understands what it means. But I think at its core, networking is very transactional. And you're trying to build your network. And so Like first and foremost, I've thought since the beginning and since people really gave me advice and coached me, like what you're really trying to do is build relationships. And there's a bunch of quotes that we've applied to relationship building, right? The most selfish thing you can do is give unselfishly. Like first and foremost, when you're building relationships, you want to give as much as possible and you want to try to not ask for anything, right? And you want to spend those years building the actual core of the relationship with each person. You know, relationships are like muscles and, you know, with muscles, you need to work the muscles, right? And you need to maintain relationships and you need to give, you need to check in. And the worst kinds of folks are, you know, transactional networkers who, you know, ping you every year when they want something from you. And the best kinds of folks are, you know, long-term relationship builders where they really genuinely care about you as a person and your family and your business and they try to help you and you actually really establish a deep relationship and that takes many many years but then when you need help and you you know want to do business with the other person it's very natural because there's a real relationship there and so there are no shortcuts in relationship building it just takes years and years and i think you know people need to play the long game right it's extremely difficult to make any meaningful amount of money or to build 
any meaningful amount of relationships within a couple of years. Like it doesn't matter who you are, but within a few years, there's just no good way to make a lot of money, have a big business success, have a big nonprofit success, have a big impact, have dozens of close friends. There's that great quote, you know, that basically people always overestimate what they can do in the short term. Like everybody overestimates. Well, if I make these goals in the next three years, I can do all these things. So they overestimate in the short term, but they underestimate in the long term. Because in the long term, all these things actually start to compound, right? The money you make compounds, your business actually takes a long time to scale up to 10 people. But from 10, it suddenly goes, you know, to 20 to 40 to 80 to, you know, 160 people or, you know, the relationships you have, it takes so long to build those 10 great relationships. But once those are there, each of those 10 people, now they're inviting you to things. And suddenly, it really is an exponential growth. And so I can't stress enough. Like for me, I've always made short term, medium term and long term goals. And like a short term goal might be in the next three years or the next two years. And a medium term goal might be from like, two to five years. And a long term goal might be well, where do you want to be in 10 years from now? And I, I've always kind of, whether you write those down, it's like really tangible goals, or whether you just think about it at a high level, like let's just say you want to be a professional chef and whether you want to open a restaurant or start a food brand, like there's just not a lot you can pull off in the first year or two. But if you really are thinking 10 years ahead, I think almost universally people underestimate by many, many times what they can do, you know, in five or seven or 10 years. Right, right. You said a few things there that I think are really like, valid for people to pay attention to. And that is like being almost transformational, not transactional when it comes to relationships, because we all know the people that, like you said, when you when they reach out to you, they're like, oh, you're like, oh, man, like, what do they want? Right. And then you answer them or you don't answer them. And then you don't hear from them again until they ask for something else or they don't reach out because they know that they're not going to get anything from you. And I think it's really important to continue to build these relationships in a way that's organic and that you're just coming from a level of service and trying to figure out what kind of value you can not only add to their life, but how you can show that you genuinely care about that person and not just what they're doing business wise, but like you said, with their family, what are some of the, the best things that you do to maintain these relationships? Because I think we're all, we're all so busy with our own stuff that sometimes it can be challenging to reach out to certain people and you might not talk to somebody for like, six, seven months, and you don't want to come across as, as awkward maybe when you're reaching out to them after talk, not talking to them for a while. So do you have like a, like a, I don't want to say system, but do you have a way that you will just go through your phone and just reach out to random people and see how they're doing? Or maybe it's like you theme it around the birthday or, or what's your process for that? I think the key to any person's success is making it uniquely their own style. And so if you're an artist, it could be really appropriate to send, you know, handwritten pieces of art for holidays or birthdays. You know, if you're a musician, it could be, you know, fun to bring people into your songs or, you know, invite them to album release parties or, you know, send them your updated music. If you're a chef, it could be fun to, you know, send them recipes you've made, right? So because we're all different and all unique... I think this is something people struggle with, you know, really understanding is each of us is unique. And so the thing that works for Tony Robbins isn't going to work for, you know, Elon Musk, you know, is going to be different than Michelle Obama is going to be different than you. Like these people are so different, like radically different. And so, you know, for me, I'm a bit of a spontaneous person. So I really like just spontaneously FaceTiming people. And I think people almost get a kick out of it, like miss FaceTime call. Like, why is this, you know, person just FaceTiming me until they realize, you know what, I really like it. Like this, this guy just FaceTimes me every couple months just to check in. That's a cool thing. And I actually got kind of known for doing that. And people really look forward to it. And so I think when you kind of realize who you are, utilize that to stay in touch with folks. Yeah, that's a really good point. Because so many times, like, and we, we've talked about this before, like with, with with sticking to what like works for you as far as like the college route, that I think I think so many times people will try to like figure out what works for somebody else. And they're going to assume it just works for them, for them too. And it just doesn't like you have to choose your, find your style and figure out what, like what remains 
like authentic to you so that you don't come across as being awkward or maybe like in a different persona that the person you're trying to connect with is like, wait a second, like this definitely isn't you. Like, why are you trying so hard or why are you acting like that? I know you talk about um, in your book, Make No Small Plans, you talk about the importance of remaining authentic. And I think this is a good segue into that. I think a lot of people struggle with this because I think people try too hard to remain authentic or they're just not even aware of what they truly value, what their goals are, what types of people they like to spend time with because they're so caught up in what other people are doing. So what if, what, what tips do you have for somebody who's maybe listening to this and doesn't really know what they stand for, or doesn't really know if they're being authentic so that they can take the steps to not only discover that, but to kind of carry that out in the way they exemplify themselves personally and professionally? Well, the best way to be authentic is to ask yourself one simple question, which is, what am I interested in? That's, that's generally my favorite question. What am I interested in? Not what am I passionate about or what are my dreams? Those are very high pressure questions. I, I, don't, I don't like those questions. What am I interested in? Oh, I'm interested in cooking. Oh, I'm interested in you know, fitness. I'm, uh, you know, I'm interested in... Uh, you know, speaking this foreign language. Oh, I'm interested in, in history. We just, what are you interested in? You write down all the things you're interested in. And then you just go pursue all those things, right? And that, that immediately brings out an authenticity. And I find if I ask people, like most people are interested in half a dozen things. And some people like me, like I'm interested in like dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of things. So you just start pursuing those things that you're interested in. That's it. And, and that starts to make you authentic, because you're pursuing things you're interested in, right? Oh, I, you know, I really love this type of dance. And now I'm doing it two nights a week. Okay, that's, that's authentic. When you're living a life pursuing things you're uninterested in, that's inauthentic. And so I think you ask yourself, what am I interested in? Then you start pursuing the things you're interested in. You know, I'm really interested in reading. And now I'm reading a book a week, whatever it is. And then you just share that with people. And when they say like, Doug, what have you been up to? You just say, well, I just love, you know, reading poetry. And I decided I was going to read 20 poetry books this year. And I'm reading this poetry book right now. And there's this poem that resonated with me like this. Or, you know, I realized I'm just a terrible cook. And I always wanted to learn how to make Italian food. And so I actually got this pizza oven. I built it myself, believe it or not. It cost $30 and I'm making pizzas every, whatever it is. And I think when you just start to live the things you're interested in. You know, I always want to take sailing lessons and I'm finally doing that. You know, I always wanted to, I was always interested in just working uh, at the boys and girls club in my city. And now I'm, I'm doing it once a week. Like when you just start doing the things you're interested in, you just become authentic. And then you just share about it and people think, wow, that person, that's a really authentic, real person. I really like them. Right. And I like the introspective question of what is it that I'm interested in? Because again, it goes back to, I guess, what I was saying a few minutes ago as well, and that it gives you the opportunity to actually focus on like what you want out of life and what you're doing instead of like what your the people you're following on social media are doing or what your neighbor's doing or what your coworkers are doing. And it really forces you to not only look within, but maybe you don't know what you want. And it brings this awareness to you like, man, like I haven't taken up a new hobby in quite a long time. Or I didn't realize that all I did was work because I really have just lost track at what excites me other than that. So I think that's a, a really good point. I'm so glad that you brought that up. We have to move from consumption to creation. And it's okay to do some consuming. But I think that if most of us asked ourselves, what is the breakdown of consumption versus creation in our lives? It would be too, way too heavily toward consumption. And we want to shift and start creating, whether you call them hobbies, whether it's painting, whether it's, you know, doing a lunch every single day, like, uh, you know, Keith Ferrazzi recommends and never eat alone, like just meet a new person every day, whatever it is, you know, you want to shift from consumption to creation and you want to start living a life where you're doing. And I can't stress that, that concept enough. You know, how can I move from consumption to creation? And it starts with asking what you're interested in and then just going and doing those things. Yeah, well said. I want to get into Summit Series a little bit because I'm, I'm fascinated in the story behind this and like the amount of hustle you did and, and how this all kind of came about it was just like almost, it was like unintended in a way at the beginning. So talk about, I know it started, if I remember, it was just maybe like 15, 20 people 
just kind of coming together for the common good. And then now it's evolved, like I said, into one of the most highly sought after personal development um, experiences that exist. So talk about like what it was like at the beginning and then some, some major steps that happen that have gotten it to where it is today. Well, what happened is that I dropped out of college. I took a semester off after I'd started this business with my dad because we'd had some success. I'd had some sales. There was some revenue coming in. People were really enjoying the product, which is this email newsletter about real estate. And I moved back into my bedroom that I'd lived in my entire life. And I realized that even though I was having some skills, some success at selling real estate, I did not know anything else about business. And when I asked myself, well, what am I interested in? I was really interested in meeting other people who I could talk about business with. And specifically, what am I interested in? I would really love to meet some other young entrepreneurs because it can really feel like you're on an island when you're an entrepreneur and you know there's other islands out there, but you can't see them. And so I had this idea. I talk about low risk. I cold called people that I always read about. Not famous people, just people from Inc. Magazine or Entrepreneur Magazine. The first you know, people were the founders of Vimeo and College Humor and the founder of Tom's Shoes. And I cold called them and I said, hey, I'm also an entrepreneur in my early 20s. I really want to get a few dozen other young entrepreneurs together just so we could trade ideas and really build a, a peer group of other entrepreneurs. I mean, being an entrepreneur, as anyone who's an entrepreneur knows, is not glamorous most of the time. It's a lot of hard work in pursuit of your dream. And so people started saying yes. And that's when I knew I had a little bit of momentum. And I knew, hey, if I could get 20 people to come on this trip, I could probably sell some sponsors to cover most of the cost. So, you know, my initial outreach was pretty low risk because if everybody said no, then just not a big deal if it didn't happen. Uh, no harm, no foul. That's it. You know, if they said yes, wow, I could really, you know, build this first trip. So cold called a couple dozen people, 19 people said yes. They said yes to, I will come on a three-day ski trip with you to Utah. That's what I invited them to. And I then cold called some potential sponsors for a little bit of money, like a VC firm and a real estate brokerage. I said, hey, it would be really great. You know, maybe your VC firm could get some good deals here. Your real estate brokerage could get a, uh, an office uh, leasing deal out of this trip. So I raised, you know, most of the money to cover the cost of the trip. And that was the first summit, like 19 random people showing up to Utah, super awkward the first day, like nobody really knew each other. What was this trip? But what happened is this, like within the first hour, everyone just started, you know, meeting everyone else. Hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so. And they realized, wow, this person has a really interesting business. This person has this really interesting nonprofit. And within first couple hours, everyone realized like this is a really interesting group of people. And that first trip profoundly changed each of the attendees' lives just because they let, we, you know, you know how impactful it is if you make one new friend. Imagine leaving with a dozen new friends and relationships. And so everyone said after the first trip, wow, can you do that again? And I planned a trip six months later for 60 people. And over the next, you know, 15 years, I had a few co-founders join, you know, Brett Levy, Jeff Rosenthal, Jeremy Shorts, one other guy, Ryan Beagleman, and, and we built Summit for, for 15 years, from 19 people to 60 people. And the idea was, let's build a multidisciplinary, you know, music, content, and arts festival where entrepreneurs can meet each other. Wow. That's awesome, man. I mean, I, I got goosebumps like thinking about that because I'm thinking, I'm remembering the first time I went to an event where there was like-minded people in the industry and that same feeling that you all felt during that first summit was exactly how I felt as well. Like you feel like, man, like you get back home and it's almost like buzz, like a buzzkill. You're like, gosh, like I felt so like alive when I was around these other people and now it's kind of back to reality and you are often wondering like, how can I continue to recreate this experience so that like the energy levels stay high, you stay that motivated, you stay that fired up and that inspiring. I have to, I guess, I guess imagine that you faced a lot of rejection early on and even over the last 15 years, where whether it be reaching out to sponsors, whether it be trying to fill events at times, whether it be cold calling certain people to come to the events and speak and what have you. And I think a lot of people, they don't take this type of risk or chance and put themselves out there because they're so afraid of being rejected. 
what have been some of your best practice through the years at, at dealing with rejection and really using it to your advantage? I mean, the best thing I ever did was have co-founders because when you try to do something by yourself, that's a really difficult burden to carry. And I think, you know, having co-founders is not necessarily natural because you grow up and of course you have the support of your family, but really you have to go through high school and then college on your own. Like you don't, you have some study groups here or there and some friends, but they're not co-founders, right? Co-founders, you literally sign your binding oath and share your company together and share your dream together. It's not just like a friend you hang out with a couple of times a week. Like they're your co-founder. You're in it to win it with them up or down. And so I think having co-founders has been a foundational part of my journey. And it's, it's made everything so much better. The highs are better when you have success and the lows, you're shoulder to shoulder with other people who are going to help you get through it. And, you know, there were many times when Summit hit lows. There was a time when after our second event, 90 people came to the first, 60 to the second, and we were going to do the third event with 120 people. And the first two events, we'd made them free and we'd cover the costs with sponsors. And for the third event, we just couldn't get enough sponsor dollars to cover. And also we were now in the, you know, deep in the 2008, 2009 depression, recession. So there was no sponsor dollars. So we decided to charge for the tickets. And at my behest, they get my, you know, I was leading the charge. We communicated this extremely poorly. And so we emailed everyone who'd come before and then all the new contacts, hey, we're charging for tickets. But just a few months before, the tickets had been free. And so after that second event, on the way to the third event, I inadvertently blew up the entire Summit community. Now, it was only 60 people at the time, but literally people were calling me and writing me like, I'm never going to speak to you again. Like, how dare you? Like, if you want to charge us, how dare you just send an email? You know, who do you think you are? Right. And the issue wasn't around paying. It was around my terrible communication. And I just hadn't paused. Just in my, you know, full charge, I hadn't slowed down to think. And I was devastated, like, you know, back almost 15 years ago, like I wanted to shut down the company. I was like, I'm done with events. I don't want to show my face. I made the cover of Gawker, which was like my first time ever, you know, being made fun of in the press. I was, I was mortified. And, you know, if I hadn't had co-founders, I think I probably would have stopped doing the events because I didn't know how to dig out of it. But when I had co-founders, they came together and they said, look, let's build this thing back up. I'll head the charge with, you know, building the communities, you know, someone else. I'll head the charge, you know, planning the event. Someone else. I'll head the charge on all the new branding, right? And so just when you have a team of people, it makes it so much better. And I can't stress enough, like so many people think that in order to start a business, you have to be the creative person. You have to be the CEO. You have to know the finance. It's not like that. That's why you have co-founders, because especially like in our case, we, there's five co-founders, including myself, each person took on a different role. So each person could do what they did best. And so I think having a business, whether two, three, four co-founders, that would be just a huge thing that I would impress upon anybody. That's, that's well said. Obviously, you've created a, a pretty established brand around the Summit Series and people are, are excited to come to your events. But there's a lot of events, maybe not specifically like Summit, but there's a lot of events that bring like-minded people together on a somewhat regular basis. Like, What do you think has separated Summit from those other events that has, again, it's been, you've been going on 15 years. Like, like, What do you think has separated Summit that has just kept people excited to come to these events time and time again? Well, when Summit started in 2008, there were no events for this new generation of entrepreneurs who suddenly were building, you know, apps on the back of the, you know, iPhone app store, right? This was like a major breakout now that the iPhone was launched and the app store launched, like suddenly you had almost like a gold rush that anybody could build anything on the back of the app store. And so this was like, I want to say thousands of new businesses effectively being started a day, right? It really was like a gold rush, 2008, 2009, 2010. And that, you know, hasn't slowed down, right? It went from the app store revolution to every single consumer product being reimagined, 
right? You can think of like every single product that you use. And there's now like the company's probably a new company in the last 10 years, right? From all the mattresses to the furniture, to the plates you use, to, you know, your technology, to your, you know, your, your sneakers, to your clothes. Like these are all new brands, right? And so this entrepreneurial revolution started. And so when Summit began, Summit was the only event catering to this new demographic of people and doing it in a way that was very authentic, right? Like our events were all night, you know, just as much music and lifestyle programming as content, right? Like you go to kind of the traditional events for an older generation and, it, you know, the, ends, the events literally like start at 8 a.m. and end at 4.30, and there's not even any evening programming. And, you know, our events just were getting going at 8 p.m. at night. I mean, of course, there was content all day, but, you know, we would have dozens of musical acts, late night food trucks, just the activations we were doing, I think, were so relevant. And people really resonated with the programming at Summit. And so we've kept that for 15 years. And, like, we've consistently always tried to program, you know, what's next, the speakers, the performers, the artists, the nonprofits. And, you know, we've just made a huge effort with, you know, what the content is that we're going to program, what the venues are. And, you know, we've also built a community that really connects with the other folks in the summit community. And so look, we, I think the bottom line is we've continued to have to reinvent our events because, you know, what got you here won't get you there. And so we've had to continue to reimagine, you know, the programming and the design, you know, to, you know, at the end of the day, we are in service of the summit community and it's a lot of work to build any product in service of a community. And that's, that's the same way that we view it. hundred percent. And I feel that a lot of the biggest connection time and breakthroughs come when you're like not working on like inside the business, so to speak, like during the day when you're just inundated with with content, you're inundated with speakers, like sharing these different strategies on business, this business, that. But when you can kind of like let loose and let go a little bit, I think then some of those things kind of come to mind. Then I think you're even able to de more deeply and authentically connect with the people that you're with. Obviously, like one of the biggest benefits of these events is people walk away with these incredible breakthroughs, whether it's something professionally, personally, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, whatever it is. And I know that your major role in this is being a co-founder, making sure that everything kind of works, works out in the right way. I would imagine that you've probably had some breakthroughs yourself too. So like looking back on the last 15 years of doing these events, like what has been like the biggest breakthrough you've had at one of these events? The two things that happen when you go to a really well put together event that has great content, great people, just a great experience is really two things that happen and they happen concurrently. The first is that throughout that experience, you're having the chance to meet people you should have been already friends with. And you're having the chance to build new relationships. And at a really well put together event, just like at a great dinner, like you can come away with not just dozens and dozens of new contacts, but legitimately a dozen really close friends. And I think people will often joke when they see me like, wow, like how many close friends do you have? But it's because I've gone to so many events for so many years. And because there's just so many incredible people in the world, like how could I not desperately want to be close friends with these people? They're amazing. And I always joke, you know, that that summit is for all the people you should have been friends with, right? Like there's no rule on how many close friends we can have. It's just, if you don't put yourself in a position to really put the effort in to meet other people like yourself, then you just won't meet other people like yourself and you won't meet other, you know, and when I say like yourself, they may have totally different views and mindsets and backgrounds, but they're, they're someone who's going to deeply, you know, connect with you. And the second thing that you experience that are really well put together is just the content. You know, the people speaking, you know, if there's a thousand people on an event or 300 people at the event, you might leave with a dozen friends, but you're going to leave with a deep level of knowledge and, and especially inspiration. You know, even though all the content you could ever see at an event is online, there's something that happens when you're in person experiencing the content. And when you're listening, when you're listening in a completely present way, in the same way, if I said to you, like, 
why do you ever need to see your parents in person again? You could just see them on Zoom. And you, and you would explain all the obvious reasons why you want to see your parents in person or your siblings. It's the same thing with incredible content, like being in the room, feeling the energy. It's like when you're sitting at home by yourself and you're just kind of out of ideas, but then you get in the car, maybe you need to go run an errand. But you're in the car and now you're moving, got the music on, and suddenly you feel, wow, I should really do this. You know, I should make that call. Oh, that was a good idea. I'm going to execute on that. And you've been driving for like 15 minutes and suddenly the ideas start flowing. You know, that that's what happens when you're in a room with great people. And so I think for me, it's a combination of all the ideas that have come to me and the you know, new opportunities. Like I met the person who introduced us to Powder Mountain. We ended up buying Powder Mountain Ski Resort in 2013 because I met from a summit event an attendee who brought us the idea for Powder Mountain. You know, I met through the summit community, my wife. I, you know, met people who have coached me on health and wellness for my family and for myself. People who've given me like deep advice on how I can, you know, eat healthier and live a healthier lifestyle. And then of course, just my best friends. Like I've met, you know, so many of them, if not most of them from going to the events. So my experience at events has been incredible. And it's, look, it takes a lot of work and there's no overnight successes. But when you put yourself in, you know, in position to meet other people and you go with an open mind, I think that, you know, from my experience, anyone who's done that has come back with great relationships and a new, you know, found set of knowledge. Yeah. Amen to that. I mean, I feel the same way when I've gone to, to events like that as well. And there's people that are listening to this that maybe they're familiar with events like Summit and like others, but they just haven't, they haven't gone to them just simply out of fear because they don't, again, they don't want to come across as being awkward. They don't know what to say. They don't know like what they're going to get out of it. Like what's your advice to, to a first timer who is timid about coming to an event like Summit or something else where they're nervous about like how to act, how to handle things, like how to connect in a way that works for them? Like, what do you tell people who are like on the fence about coming? Well, I think the most interesting types of people are introverts. And I think it's the most obvious mistake investors have made for a long time is discounting introverts because we tend to think the people who are, you know, great at relationship building or, you know, networking, you know, very outgoing are also the brilliant people, but so many of the brilliant people are introverts. And I think, you know, for so many people, it comes very naturally to want to go to events. But for the people you're describing, like a lot of that subset is introverted people and it does not come naturally. And that's definitely something we've thought about for a long time at our events. And so, you know, I think we've put a lot of effort into making sure that when you come to a summit event, no matter how introverted or extroverted you are, you know, whether you have a disability, whether English is not your first language, I mean, whatever challenge you would have, we always want summit to be as inclusive as possible. And we've set up a lot of the programming throughout the weekend and especially on the first day to basically welcome anyone who's never been before to the event. So examples of that would be anything from like on your attendee credential, anyone who's been before will have like a sub credential that'll show that'll basically it's a symbol that means, you know, come over and say hi to me, come meet me and I can show you around right? Like the OG summiters, right? The people who've been coming for many years. And, you know, for new folks, we're really intentional about, you know, a lanyard's, you know, saying, having the symbol, like this is their first time. And then anyone who's been before will come over and say hi, right? Like all events are different, but the ethos of the summit events is that it's summit is supposed to feel like dinner at a family friend's home, right? Where like, you can just walk over to anybody and just say hello. Like, kind of the opposite of the terrible experience at a bar where it's awkward to say hi to anybody and nobody wants to meet new people. Um, we have, you know, things like, call it, you call it like speed networking, but where you might have people sit at a table and every three minutes you move seats one and you meet a different person. So within an hour, you can say hi to 20 new people and actually just kind of superficially get to know them. Um, we have tons of small content sessions and breakouts. So there's a lot that we do, you know, we'll have, uh, you know, we'll assign seats often for the dinners. So you can just show up to a dinner and you'll be placed next to someone rather than having to, you know, 
sit awkwardly at a table hoping, you know, somebody sits next to you. But but I would say in general for us, we have created a culture where if somebody sees someone sitting by themselves, they would just go over and sit next to them. That would that is very much for the last 15 years been part of the summit culture to build the kind of place that we would want to go where everyone would make everybody else feel like very very included and very welcome and part of the community and I definitely think there would be broad, like almost everyone, if they were asked, do you agree or disagree with what I'm sharing now? Who's come to Summit would say, I, I totally agree. Um, like, And I'll just say, like, for example, like we have always been adamant of like not having, you know, secret side rooms at Summit. And like, you know, once you come to the thing, there's, you know, different levels and secret backstage this. Like once you come, you're, you know, basically welcome to everything. That's beautiful, man, because I think from the outside looking in from somebody who's maybe never been to an event, they probably would think that there's these separate clicks and that you have to maybe have been to five or six events to be able to experience all the things that people who have been in coming that long get to experience. And I'm really glad that you brought up like the inclusivity aspect of it to help people feel welcome when they're there and also connecting them to people who have come before to kind of help show them around a bit and help answer any questions. I know in your book, again, it's called uh, Make No Small Plans. You talk about like reputation. I gather through the years, you've probably between people at your events, between hiring people, between being, bringing people in to speak, you've, you've dealt with a lot of different reputations. Some have been great and there's probably some that have been bad. I like to go like the, the don't do this approach. So if you were to say there are a few things that people should like, what are the a few of the things that you think really damage people's reputations in your mind and based on your experience and dealing with a lot of people th throughout the years? Well, skipping the obvious ones, right? Like lying and stealing and having low integrity, right? Like skipping the obvious ones. I think that being overly transactional is probably the biggest turnoff that somebody can experience, right? Where when they meet John, John's always selling something. John's always pushing his agenda, you know, or, you know, they're meeting someone else. That person's, you know, never listening. So I think, I think that being overly transactional is soul crushing. And, you know, the inverse of overly transactional is someone who's just giving, listening, you know, totally engrossed in the other person. You know, and I think you just don't want to get a reputation as, you know, somebody who's too big time, right? We had these guidelines for Summit we wrote like over a decade ago, and we, we've basically kept the same guidelines, right? And one is don't fanboy the big timers and don't big time the startups, right? Like, because we'll have like these extremely well-known people and the idea is like anyone can go talk to them, but just go talk to them, go have a conversation, go ask them questions, go challenge them. But don't fanboy them and ask for photos. And on the flip side, you know, if you're a big timer, don't snub the startups. And I think Summit's worked extremely well because of this guideline, because the big timers really love learning from the next generation. And Summit's a really safe place to do that. And that like when the big attendees would come, like a Jeff Bezos, I remember him staying for, I think it was like most of the event. And I just I would just watch him in the courtyard, just, you know, going at it with all the attendees, you know, not and not talking at them, listening, what are you working on? What are you working on? What are you working on? Why? What's, you know, and so I think at its best, like, when generations can mingle, there's so much learning for both the mentee and the mentor. One of our other guidelines was go on a learning safari. And I think people who've, you know, have good event experiences, they don't have a cherished outcome. I have to go to this content session. I have to meet this person. And that's someone I have to meet. And then I have to sit front row at that. Like the best people just go through a choose your own adventure and serendipitously, you know, end up at the, you know, the ramen noodle bus in the middle of the forest at 3 a.m. at, you know, one of our events sitting next to people they become lifelong friends with. And so I think the people who've done the best or people who are just spontaneous and they go with the flow. And again, I think when you have a mindset of no cherished outcome, right, you have no goal. You just, you're just there to share and to learn and to give. 
you know, that sets you up for both the best event experience, but it also, you know, I think people really enjoy being around that type of a person. Yeah. It's, it's again, very well said, man, because I think there's two things that are big turnoffs to people and you were spot on like somebody who's like overly obsessive with somebody like somebody who they meet somebody for the first time and all they're doing is just like photo this photo that and complimenting this commenting that or oh my gosh like i love this i love that and it almost makes the person feel uncomfortable and like one of the things that that i've learned just from doing the podcast and having some well-known people on here too and and it relates exactly to what you're what you just said is that people want to be talked to like they're people <laughs> You know, and I think you can connect on a deeper level with somebody who maybe might be more successful than you if you treat them like as a human being and you guys are on the same kind of like level, like the same playing field in a way that you're you're a colleague of them and you're not necessarily a fan. So I think that was a great point. There's a great quote, Doug. uh, Friend or fan? Pick one. <laughs> yeah, it's true, man. And trust me, I've made the mistake of being the fan. Like early on, I remember I was writing a book where I was uh, interviewing a bunch of people who, who beat drug addiction from all walks of life. And sometimes when I would come across somebody who who was famous, I would like geek out a little bit and be super excited because I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe like I might have the potential opportunity to talk with this person or that person. But what I learned is that a lot of these people, they felt more comfortable when you treated them like a human being and not necessarily like they were an idol of yours, at least in my experience as well. Yeah, I think it just goes back to being authentic. You can tell them, hey, you know, I read your book. It changed my life. I absolutely loved it. Here's all the takeaways. You've been a huge inspiration to me and I'm just really happy to meet you. And now let's get into it. You know, like you don't have to pretend, oh, I didn't read their book and they're not, you know, someone I look up to, but just tell them the truth. That means a lot to them, you know, for anybody. It doesn't matter if they were the president hearing that a piece of legislation they wrote changed your life or a book they wrote or a talk they give. You tell them that it means a lot to everybody. And then you just, you know, they probably are interested in hearing from you. Right. Yeah, absolutely. hundred percent. One of the last things I want to talk to you about is it seems that your ability to be successful in this business not only has been your ability to remain authentic to yourself, uh, cultivate and maintain meaningful relationships, but also to create experiences. Like we've talked about this theme of experience when it comes to Summit. And I want to kind of relate it back to maybe the average person or a family who's looking to create an experience for their kids. Maybe they're going on a vacation somewhere, they're taking a day trip or they're traveling. Like what are some of the the best ways to to add value to an experience that maybe don't break the bank? but can certainly like take a, like a C level trip or experience to a, to an A or B level experience. Well, most of the best things are free or cost little money and involve creativity, whether that's a gift, you don't need to spend hundreds of dollars buying someone clothes and dope sneakers. You can, you know, make them something or write them a deeply meaningful letter. And when it comes to traveling, there's just so many experiences, whether it's, you know, in your city or within a few hours of your city that you can drive to and then explore, whether it's, you know, the local botanical gardens, right? Whether it's the various local museums. I mean, in every city, there are so many interesting art exhibits, you know, whether it's, you know, you know, just setting a goal of a, you know, making your own scavenger hunt around the city of interesting things that you want to see in that city, you know, I made a goal when the weather's nice to never miss a farmer's market on a Saturday ever again for the rest of my life. After I heard Alice Waters set that goal, I thought that is amazing. She's never missed a farmer's market. I'm going to make that my goal. You know, every city has a farmer, literally every town and city in the world has a farmer's market on Saturdays. And the bigger ones have farmer's markets a few days a week. The amount of free concerts that every town and city has right? There's just, there's just so much available and so many people are so in the box of plans are very basic in the day and you kind of twiddle your thumbs and go to the shopping district and, or the mall. And then at night you go to some fancy restaurant. I mean, I'd rather get some cheap takeout food or cook something ourselves, and, you know, go sit under the stars and make a picnic. So in general, it's funny you ask that question because 
and my wife and I are always trying to do, you know, really out there creative ideas, you know, constantly. I mean, whatever sport you play, by the way, you go play in the city and meet, you know, new people who play that sport because there's pickup of every single sport you could possibly play in every single city. So anyway, you definitely hit a nerve in terms of a uh, good nerve in terms of something that uh, excites me. Yeah, because I was wondering, like, how has the creativity in creating these experiences on a on a professional level, like how has it spilled over into your your personal level with your family? And I'm, I'm glad that we, we touched on that because I think a lot of people, maybe they're struggling financially and they can't afford to drop 10 grand on a nice vacation right now because of what's happened over the last few years or maybe just their financial situation that's been going on for, for a decade or whatever. And I think you you brought up this, this interesting concept that is so true, by the way, that most of the the be- most beautiful things in life are free. Yeah, I, I saw this viral YouTube video a few years ago, Doug, about this guy named Steven Jepson, who's like 80 years old, who's just like this wild, eccentric character who like can skateboard on one foot and builds these crazy bicycles and these kayaks and he juggles. He's like the most just wild, like 80 year old guy. And, and my wife and I did a road trip to the suburbs of Orlando to try to meet him. Like I tracked down his number and we met him and we got to go hang out in his backyard and see all his quirky random things. And so I very much resonate that the best things are free or very inexpensive. Yeah, dude, that's awesome. That's so cool that you were able to, to track him down. It sounds like a not only a, a fun trip, but probably one that you you learn, I'm sure, a ton of wisdom, t- a ton of uh, life insights from a guy like that. Well, Elliot, man, this has been amazing. I feel like I could talk to you all day because I like talking shop about this stuff, but I want to be respectful of your time. And with that said, like I wanted to thank you for coming on the show. I know that when this episode comes out, your book's going to be out make no small plans. So if people want to pick that up, if they want to learn more about you or Summit Series, like where's the best place for them to, to do that? Yeah, the book the book will be at every bookstore or you know, grab it on Amazon. Make no small plans. Sweet. Well, we'll make sure to include that in the show notes. And for those listening, what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway. Maybe it was something that Elliot said about the importance of building authentic relationships. Maybe it was something that he said on uh, remaining authentic for yourself. Maybe it was something that he said just a few minutes ago about creating like meaningful experiences in a way that doesn't cost a lot of money. Or maybe it was something that he said about mitigating risk, especially early on in his career. Whatever it was, make sure to tag him, tag myself, because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again thank you for listening to this episode of The Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bopes, and we'll see you next time.